I am uh, delighted to be here. Thank you to the organizers. And please take note of the uh, little footnote at the bottom of the first slide. Um, so I, I'm going to talk uh, about some of the work that my colleagues and I um, have been doing uh, for a number of years now, maybe like a decade or so. Um, and they have uh, crystallized recently into uh, two books. Um, uh, one came out uh, earlier this year uh, called Taming the Tide of Capital Flows, and it's published by MIT Press, for those of you who are uh, interested. And the other um, is coming out in January of next year called Confronting Inequality. Um, and I think you can pre-order it on Amazon already. It's going to be published by Columbia University Press. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go on uh, by uh, mutual agreement for slightly more than 15 minutes, um, but we'll, we'll end on time. Uh, and, you know, the, the work that I'm going to be talking about is, uh, is technical in nature. It's, it, it's been published in peer-reviewed economics journals, um, but my talk is going to be policy-oriented. So I'm going to give you the main messages of the work and not going to torture you with detail. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I did my PhD 30, 35 years ago at the University of Chicago. Um, and the, the sort of first uh, line on this, on this um, slide was really something that was drilled, uh, drilled home to me, that basically economists should worry about growth rather than about its distribution. Uh, and uh, what lies behind that is the idea that growth will trickle down, and also that redistribution is, is fundamentally antithetical to growth. Uh, when Tom Sargent won his Nobel Prize, he gave a talk, um, and I, I don't think I do too much of an injustice to say he, he talked about some basic economic truths, and one of them is pretty close to the idea that you uh, undercut incentives with redistribution at your peril. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty about what delivers growth, but at sort of 30,000 feet, I think there is some degree of confidence on the part of economists, qua policy advisors, about what some important ingredients are for growth, and, and they include sort of uh, unleashing the supply side of the economy through structural reforms like liberalization and deregulation, making yourself open uh, to global forces, be it in goods markets or factor markets, capital, labor, uh, uh, and so forth. And also, you know, um, having macroeconomic stability, having policies that are not going to let uh, public debt get out of hand, that are not going to lead to uh, high or runaway inflation. Um, and, and the origins of, of these kinds of views, I think, uh, go back uh, a long way. I've put, uh, I've put some quotes up here that, that uh, are nearly 100 years old, um, and some of them will be familiar to you. But, but the last one uh, may be slightly less familiar, and it's something that, that I did hear uh, Bob Lucas say uh, once in a class, and it's basically... Uh, let me read it, of the tendencies that are harmful to sound economics, the most seductive, and in my opinion, the most poisonous, is to focus on questions of distribution. So let me, let me just uh, advertise that what I plan to do is politely disagree with that, with that last quote. Um, so just uh, some, some basic facts. I think, I think policymakers around the world have, have uh, digested the main message about, about how you, uh, uh, you know, set the stage for, for, for strong and healthy growth through deregulation and a, a circumscribed role for the state. Um, what what um, I'm going to argue for instead is uh, that economists and policymakers essentially have to walk and chew gum at the same time. They're going to have to focus on two things. So far from it being the case, uh, that it's uh, a poisonous thing to do to, uh, to look at questions or, or, or take seriously questions of distribution. I think it's, um, it's going to be essential uh, going forward to consider uh, how we lay the foundations for healthy growth and a healthy uh, distribution of income. Um, and I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think my colleagues will talk about uh, more as we go forward is the fact that um, we are increasingly recognizing that virtually every economic policy 
uh, on which we are called upon to provide advice uh, poses some degree of an equity efficiency trade-off. Um, so we see this um, in policies that are, are really uh, designed to spur growth, that are wh whose main primary target uh, is to uh, expand the size of the pie. But even for those policies, we need to think more about uh, uh, sort of the distributional consequences of, uh, of those kinds of policies. If for no other reason than, as I'm going to argue in just one second, um, questions of distribution have a direct impact on the sustainability and level of growth. So you ignore distributional questions at your peril because the key to sustained growth, a key to sustained growth, uh, is that you not get uh, let inequalities uh, at the national level uh, get out of hand. Um, there's another uh, uh, stream in this work which, which relates to globalization, opening yourself up uh, to global forces. And I think we all recognize now that uh, globalization is something that hasn't worked for everybody, for all individuals or households in, in countries. Um, but most of the discussion has been about trade. And uh, the point of, uh, of a, a block of this talk uh, later is really going to argue that financial globalization needs to be part of the discussion about how globalization is inclusive or not. It's not enough just to talk about trade. It's important to talk about the globalization of finance, the, gross, the growth in cross-border capital flows. I'm not going to talk much about the last bullet on this slide, but suffice to say, one of the themes of, of, of some, some work that I've been engaged in, including a, an economic journal paper that came out a couple years ago, is that there is too much obsession about driving public debt levels to very low levels, especially in countries that have what I call adequate fiscal space, i.e. countries where there's very little real prospect of a sovereign default, not even a remote prospect. Even in such countries, we see governments driving uh, public debt to ever lower levels by running overall budgetary surpluses. And the, if you do a cost-benefit analysis of those kinds of policies, uh, the welfare effects would be, would be enhanced, rather, if countries learn to live with uh, their level of public debt, even if it is high, and let debt ratios decline organically through economic growth, rather than trying to engineer declines by running overall budgetary surpluses. So, uh, you know, recognizing that I'm not going to get through everything, let me, let me tell you the, the main results of, of these uh, different work streams. One is that fragile economic growth and inequality are two sides of the same coin. So if you have in mind to get growth going and hope that distributional problems will kind of look after themselves, that is a dangerous gamble. So think of, think of really what policymakers are trying to engineer in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. They're trying to uh, bring back a situation where the market can function well, where, um, where the financial sector can do its job, uh, and so forth. Um, and they, they recognize that before the financial crisis, globalization and, and, and market forces had not delivered inclusive growth. So they have a footnote um, to this strategy, which is that we will do better uh, in trying to deliver a broadly shared prosperity going forward. And what my uh, point is that you actually have to uh, engender policies that are going to uh, bring about the distributional goals that you have. It's not enough to say, let's just get uh, market forces functioning well again in the way they were in the great moderation and think that merely in so doing, we will solve uh, the distributional problems that were a factor in the run-up to the, to the crisis. Um, a second thing, as I said, is that uh, many policies uh, engender growth equity uh, trade-offs, and, um, and I, I won't repeat myself. I, I've said most of what is already in this, uh, in this slide. Now, um, when we uh, 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 began working on, the, on questions about inequality and what the causes of rising national uh, inequalities uh, were, Frankly, what we expected to, to find, um, which is something that 
we had been told over and over again is that the main culprits related to technology and to trade. Um, and one of the things that we learned in the process of doing this work uh, is that there, uh, this is a much hairier and multifaceted problem that has um, many more causes than just technology and trade. And some of them are listed here, and some of them I'm going to talk about, um, including finance, including uh, economic reforms. But just to say that uh, many things are in play in the rise in, of national inequalities, not only trade and technology. And, um, you know, if you were of the view that, um, you know, uh, rising national inequalities uh, is an issue that is confined to specific measures of inequality or only a handful of countries across the globe, uh, what our work shows is actually it's uh, a phenomenon that um, uh, uh, can be seen across a range of measures of national inequalities and across uh, a range of countries developing, developed, emerging. And, and why, you know, if you are a policymaker, who believes that um, the kind of economic model that we had uh, before the global financial uh, crisis is exactly the kind of model uh, that we want uh, to engender uh, uh, ongoing prosperity going forward, I think there is something that you need to worry about if you are such a policymaker, which is that the fact that that uh, economic model um, did not uh, engender shared prosperity, um, uh, might give rise to the kinds of uh, political and policy pressures that we're seeing in a number of countries recently. The rise of protectionism, the rise of inward-looking policies, the rise of nativism. So, um, if, you, if you believe that those kind of tendencies threaten uh, the economic model that was in place before the global financial crisis, then even if you don't care about distributional questions per se, you, you should care about the, the, you're forced to care about the issues of rising inequality because it will come to threaten uh, the model that you hold dear. Okay, now um, there's some obvious connections to ongoing debates. Um, uh, uh, many people, uh, not everyone, but many people uh, worry about the moral and social costs of rising inequality. And one of the things that our work shows is that there is a direct economic cost to rising inequality in the form of slower and less sustainable economic growth. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's plenty of talk about retreats from globalization. It focuses mainly on trade and to some extent migration. Let us bring finance into the discussion. It is important. Um, and in fact, um, there, is a, there is another aspect to this, which is that um, the, uh, the mobility of capital uh, across borders may make it harder for governments to remedy uh, some of the distributional consequences, the adverse distributional consequences from globalization. So if a policymaker says with a straight face, let us embrace globalization, but we will do better on inclusion going forward, we have to ask, well, how exactly is that going to be occurring? Because um, the globalization of finance and the fact that it may lead to a race to the bottom on taxation and to a smaller role for the state in the economy, that may make it harder for governments to actually remedy the distributional consequences of uh, rising integration. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to zoom through. You have a map now of what I plan to say. Um, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this next block is uh, draws on the lead uh, article in the current issue of the Journal of Economic Growth. So if you're interested, uh, you, can, uh, you can turn to it there. Um, it goes through uh, 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 sort of many different exercises trying to look at uh, empirical connections amongst uh, the level of inequality, the level or sustainability of growth episodes, 
and the extent of redistributive fiscal policies that governments uh, choose. And um, basically what it finds is that uh, high or rising inequality leads to both lower and less sustainable growth, that the direct effect of redistributive policies, unless they are extreme, are benign. So the leak in uh, Arthur Oaken's bucket in his famous book many decades ago called Equality and Efficiency, that leak, what gets lost when you transfer uh, resources from uh, the rich to the poor is actually pretty small in practice unless you're doing a lot of redistribution uh, to begin with. Um, and that the indirect effect of redistributive policies through the greater equality that those policies engender are highly protective of growth, uh, both the level of growth and the sustainability of growth. So I'm not, I, that's, that's the, it in a nutshell. Second block uh, relates to structural reforms. And I merely want to plant the idea in your head that um, virtually any policy, whether it is a product market reform, a labor market reform, a trade reform, a financial sector reform, a cross-border capital reform, all of these policies are not only going to affect the size of the pie, but are going to affect the way that the, the, what each person gets in that aggregate pie. And if I'm right that how the pie gets divided has a bearing on the sustainability and level of economic growth, then it behooves policymakers to, to design even policies that are, that are geared to the aggregate size of the pie that have nothing prima facie to do with distribution, it behooves them to design those policies with distributional uh, consequences in mind. Perhaps um, uh, designing reform packages where the winners and losers across different reforms are not the same individuals or households. And when you look at this question empirically, you do find strong evidence of the existence of these equity efficiency trade-offs across a range of reforms. Okay, let me uh, say a few words about gender. Um, uh, some of you will have um, uh, uh, heard a, a, a recent speech by Narayana Kochlarkoda in which he, um, he talked about the need for macroeconomics to pay more attention to gender issues. And, and we um, uh, uh, on this panel are very sympathetic uh, to that idea. Um, it struck us, uh, uh, you know, when we were thinking through how does bringing more women into the labor force enhance the growth potential of economies. Uh, we were struck that many of the exercises that were trying to figure out a, a quantified answer to that question um, really treated women as if they are uh, perfectly homogeneous with men. So really it was almost a headcount story. And what we wondered was whether, um, uh, you know, if as uh, my uh, boss, Christine Lagarde, says that uh, women bring different skills and talents and traits to the table when they enter the labor force, be it on corporate boards or anywhere else, then the, the notion that women and men are perfect substitutes as sort of a standard aggregate production function assumes you sum uh, the head counts of women and men, and you put labor in there and see, you know, when you add more women, labor goes up, good for growth. But um, if they are imperfect substitutes, then, um, you know, an initially scarce factor like women would have a, a greater positive effect on economic growth than adding an additional man, the plentiful factor. And so we wanted to ask, well, what do the data say about the degree of substitutability between women and men? Um, and what we find using macroeconomic data, sectoral data, and firm level data is that the data speak fairly loudly on this issue and women and men are not perfect substitutes in production. And so the gains from adding uh, women to the labor force from removing barriers to female labor force participation are actually larger uh, than you would think if you were doing these um, simple headcount type of exercises as many, uh, as many previous papers have done. 
And to boot, if you think of a multi-sector model where there is uh, home production, which you need to assess welfare benefits, and different sectors of the economy, say services and non-services, that differ in the intensity with which they use female in the production process, then what you're going to find is that the welfare costs of barriers to female labor force participation are larger than you would have thought uh, using a simple head, head count uh, type of exercise. And so this is basically what, um, what this uh, new line of work uh, is showing. It will be released at our, uh, at our annual meetings in Bali uh, uh, the month after next. Um, but basically, uh, we show theoretically how the degree of substitutability affects uh, the welfare and, uh, and GDP types of gains that you get from uh, raising female labor force participation uh, rates. We believe that the uh, empirical evidence that we adduce is consistent with a lot of microeconomic liter uh, literature on, uh, on um, uh, the substitutability between uh, women and men. Uh, we present empirical evidence using these uh, three different data sets uh, showing that the elasticity of substitution is rather low. Uh, and we quantify uh, the gains, GDP and welfare, from uh, reducing barriers to female labor force participation uh, rates. Uh, let me also add that the interpretation of history based on our estimates is rather different. Uh, think of the solo residual. Uh, and think uh, com of comparing a model um, where um, uh, you're summing men and women uh, as as if they were perfect substitutes, you're going to attribute uh, uh, you know, the gains apart from those due to uh, the augmentation of factors of production to technology. But if um, uh, women and men are in fact imperfect substitutes, what you uh, uh, attribute to technology is actually uh, going to be partly due uh, to reductions in barriers uh, to female labor force participation that have occurred uh, uh, through history. So um, uh, you know, that, that's a sort of interesting uh, uh, interpretation of uh, the historical evidence. Uh, you know, the, the estimated barriers to female labor force participation uh, have costs that differ across regions and countries, and we were able to uh, estimate those. Um, uh, this is the sort of takeaways from, from this, but I've I've already uh, talked about it. Um, let me spend a minute on financial globalization since I, I did a lot of advertising for it uh, at the beginning. Um, let me just uh, say that again here, uh, we, uh, we are trying to get a, at a causal uh, interpretation of how financial globalization affects uh, the size of the pie and its distribution causal interpretation. We're going to be doing that with macroeconomic uh, data, where uh, imparting a causal interpretation is quite challenging. Um, but we're also going to be looking at sectoral data uh, to buttress the causal interpretation. And we're going to have uh, several identification strategies. One um, is going to relate, I think the most important one is going to relate to the changing bargaining power of labor uh, when you open up to foreign capital. And I, I mentioned this uh, at the beginning of my talk. Um, um, when, when firms can uh, threaten to relocate abroad, the bargaining power of labor is much reduced. And we can, uh, we can try and assess this, uh, this channel by looking at how firms in different sectors of the economy respond to uh, idiosyncratic shocks, uh, respond in the form of laying off workers. Um, and so firms um, uh, that tend to uh, lay off a lot of workers uh, when there's an adverse idiosyncratic shock that hits them, um, uh, uh, workers that work in such firms and sectors have uh, very little bargaining power. And when you open up to capital, um, you can see um, uh, how these natural layoff rates evolve, uh, and you can get some idea of how financial globalization is actually playing out uh, through this, um, this uh, bargaining channel 
uh, uh, in the data. There are other uh, ways to identify. There's technology. Obviously, the elasticity of substitution uh, between labor and capital uh, has an important bearing if it is greater than one on interpreting these declining labor shares that we have seen. So the larger is the elasticity of substitution, the larger is the expected uh, decline in the labor share when you open up to foreign capital and the price of capital drops as a result. There is even a third uh, identification strategy, strategy which relates to um, the external financial dependence of firms operating in different sectors of the economy. The greater the external financial de dependence, the larger are going to be both the aggregate and distributional consequences of financial globalization. And in a nutshell, what we find, and we, we, we torture the data 50,000 ways, is the aggregate effects consistent with uh, much of the empirical literature. There's a whole chapter in the Taming the Tide book on this very question. Uh, the aggregate effects seem to be a drop in the bucket. When you ask the data, are, is financial globalization a supply enhancing policy? It's very difficult at that level of generality for the, for the data to speak loudly. But the distributional consequences are indeed palpable, likely reflecting one or more of the three channels that I mentioned before. Okay. Um, and this is related, this is a, a paper in the AER Papers and Proceedings uh, from a couple years ago um, where we argued that financial crises that occur in the aftermath of financial opening ups, um, uh, financial, financial opening episodes are quite costly in terms of economic growth um, and it stands to reason that uh, uh, economic crises, crises are rarely uh, particularly good for the poor. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the, the fact that uh, financially, opening, financially open countries may find it much more challenging to engage in the kinds of redistributive policies that are essential in a globalized wor world. Um, not going to spend more than one second on this part, but merely to say when you have uh, a lot of fiscal space, when you're uh, what Moody's, the rating agency, uh, calls uh, when you are in a green zone, when they, they have used the methodology that is in our EJ paper to classify countries, whether they are green zone, yellow zone, or red zone, uh, in terms of their prospect of facing a default or fiscal crisis going forward. When you are in a green zone, the cost-benefit calculus of paying down the, uh, the public debt. And this is in a model that Joe Stiglitz, um, when he discussed this paper, said was actually stacked to yield the opposite result. In such a model, the cost-benefit analysis actually suggests that you're better off from a welfare standpoint to live with high levels of public debt than to engineer uh, fiscal surpluses to pay it down. Uh, the welfare costs of the transition uh, to getting to lower public debt are actually higher than the welfare gains in perpetuity f from that lower level of public debt that you have once you get there until eternity. Okay, last slide. High inequality and low and fragile growth are two sides of the same coin. It's a dangerous gamble, therefore, to go for growth and assume equity will take care of itself. Fear of using fiscal redistribution is overblown. In fact, on average in the data, redistribution is a pro-growth policy through the greater equality it engenders. The leak in Arthur Oaken's bucket has not been that large in practice. The evidence on financial globalization, uh, the costs in terms of increased volatility are high, the output benefits seem elusive and are shared unevenly, and the other effects might include a race to the bottom on uh, on taxes and the reduced ability of the state to uh, uh, carry out essential functions. Be cognizant of growth equity trade-offs across a range of reforms. And on macro policies, the case for paying down public debt when fiscal space is ample is weak. Better simply to allow debt ratios to decline organically through economic growth. Thank you very much. Thank you.